I am devastated of what is going on in uh, uh, in the world, especially in Palestine today, and many other countries that, uh, especially the silence of the, our governments, uh, looking on the other way uh, and you know, regarding what's going on in, in the Gaza Strip and also in the West Bank and so on. So this is, I think, is a before and after this. Um, this genocide uh, uh, in the history of in, in our so-called modern history. But uh, <clears throat> the idea uh, today is uh, to uh, focus and probably we will relate back to what's going on around us uh, uh, today. But it's to focus on the on the book that um, Julie and I uh, edited for uh, some time ago now and uh, uh, just to give you some background on the book, I mean, this book comes out of another project, actually, which is the project of Dinor. I don't know if some of you probably were uh, during the project. With, it was between 2017 and 2019 in different parts of uh, the Nordic, I mean, in different Nordic countries. It was, uh, let me see, one in, it was in Gothenburg that we started. Uh, a series of workshops in Gothenburg, especially in the area of theory, I mean, decolonial uh, critique, uh, theoretical understandings on racism, coloniality, etc. And then uh, we move, uh, six months after, we moved to uh, Trondheim in Norway uh, at the Norwegian Technic and uh, Natural Science. Uh, the university where we discuss it and we focus on the question of education and pedagogy. And I think that uh, Rosalba was one of the key, it was there, yes, because I sometimes I confuse with, with Helsinki, but it was there that you were Rosalba in, uh, as a key speaker. And then uh, the last one we had in Helsinki uh, with our colleague uh, Suvi Keskinen that uh, uh, arrange, arrange it there, um, uh, and it was the question of social movements and um, uh, social mobilization in the Nordic countries in relation to questions of racism and coloniality. So uh, the background of this book is that, is, the, is this series of workshops, is this series of network uh, building, and uh, after, when we finished this uh, series of, uh, of workshops, what we did was a call for papers for in this uh, broad network. And we got some people uh, from this network to, that wanted to, uh, to contribute to, to, the, to the publishing, to the book. And that was the way we started. Now, at the beginning, we had around 14 contributors. But we, uh, after a while, we, uh, uh, we finalized with, I think, nine contributors that I will uh, name after, um, uh, on, on a little while. So uh, the idea, I mean, the contributions actually address the coloniality of knowledge in education, in academia, and development work, including fashion decoloniality and the current whitewashing of the colonial perspectives and activism. Um, the book also want to engage with different contributions to decolonization of knowledge, education, and the politics, and the political, political uh, politics in the region. Uh, it examines coloniality in relation to capitalism, white hegemony, imperialism, democracy and the political field, as well as process of anti-colonial resistance. All but one are anchoring problems faced in the Nordic. Uh, in the Nordics. The volume includes one contribution from outside the Nordic countries, which is the one uh, written by Huri Butelce, a very, uh, quite well-known uh, um, decolonial activist in France, in Paris. Uh, about white feminism and the question of um, uh, of um, uh, the veil, yeah, in uh, that what's going on in in France uh, and the Islamophobia, of course, uh, that is uh, happening and has been happening there for quite a while. 
So uh, we, we found key to include it because it deals with a problem that can seldom be discussed in deep here in the Nordic countries. And uh, for a week ago, something like that, I, I saw uh, um, uh, that uh, the, the government of, of Sweden, uh, or the parties um, that are created, the government of Sweden, wants to, to see if they can forbidden the, the bail. Yeah. Uh, here in Sweden. So, so this is something that we knew that were ca it was coming, that we knew that uh, that uh, could be possible. So the recommendations for the, um, 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 how do you call it, the, the parliament is to forbid uh, the um, debate for the Muslim population, especially directed, of course, to, to women. Uh, very aware in the, the debate. So we are in a time that uh, things are happening, things are changing, and the Nordic countries are um, very much part of it, I think. So our main point in this, uh, in this book is we say that while coloniality and decolonization have become buzzwords that are used in slogans and titles, they are also central concepts to a great variety of struggles and theoreticizations around the world. Uh, and we see the book as a contribution toward thinking seriously about what decolonization means and entails in the Nordic region, our diverse struggles here, and also as a necessary step toward coalition building across multiple oppressions. And we want, we want also to reclaim the decolonial perspective from post-structuralist and depoliticizing use of it. Yeah. Uh, to name, I mean, I want to really to name some of the, uh, not some, all of the uh, contributors of this book, because they were working a lot. They uh, struggled with the text and uh, as we did uh, with our text and with our introduction. So um, we have Huria Boutelja from France, the one I was talking about uh, with the chapter of Surviving Like Shere Said, Veil Woman and Liberalism, The Trap of the Progressive Left in France. Uh, Amani Hassani from Denmark, uh, Racializing in a Raceless Nation, Muslim Navigating Islamophobia in Denmark's Everyday Life. And then we have um, Hannah Helander, Sato Mario Pieski, and Pia Keskitalo uh, from Norway, uh, from the Samish communities in Norway, with a, with a chapter Enriching Sami Language Distance Education. Then we have a Swedish uh, scholar, Georgia Deleu, uh, writing about the virtue, uh, uh, the um, the Sami problems in the north of, of Sweden with the uh, uh, extraction, mineral extraction in the north of Sweden. And the, the title of the chapter is The Virtue of Extraction, extraction and Decolonial Recollection in Gallok, Sapni, Sapni land. Yeah. Um, as the, th the sixth uh, the chapter, we have coloniality of knowledge and the responsibility to teach Nordic education interventions in the south of Jelena Vicentic uh, from um, Bosnia, I think, uh, but working uh, was working in in, um, in Helsinki University, I think, I, I, if I remember well. Then we have Juan Velasquez Atertois. Uh, a scholar from, from here, from Gothenburg, from Gothenburg University uh, in Sweden. He wrote about Swedish television reporting on Venezuela as damnation, where he col uh, collect or, or used the, the understandings of Franz Fanon of uh, the damné. And then we have uh, a chapter uh, of uh, the Rami, uh, the, sorry, the, the Roma population. Uh, of the Roma community, uh, written by Iona Teistia and Gabriela Bancuta, creolizing subjectivities and relation relationalities within Roma Gaggi research collaborations. And the last one we have uh, Professor Marina Trostanova here from, I think he's uh, in Linshopping University in Sweden, uh, with the last chapter uh, called uh, Decoloniality between a traveling concept and a relation relational onto epistemic political stance. 
So these are the final, actually, of course, the final uh, the text, the final articles that we gather in this uh, in this uh, edited book uh, by Rutledge. Uh, and uh, yeah, it took us. I mean, this was uh, done, of course, without any fi financing. Okay, so it's important to say that we didn't have any finance to do that. We just did it as part of. Uh, our work and activism, I will say, in my case. Um, uh, and I think for Julia, uh, I can speak also. So, so um, this is the idea of the book. And I don't know, uh, Julia, if you want to add some... Yes, maybe just to... Uh, to say that the, the whole process, it was a long, long process with COVID on top of it and anyway, <laughs> but it was a, a really a wonderful process of engaging uh, with the authors and of uh, thinking together. So it was actually a nice uh, continuation of what was the idea with also with the workshops that we had. Um, and uh, of course we hope that these sort of collaborations um, also with other of the people who were in the workshops of the dinner uh, can continue because um, there is, I mean, there is a lot of, of need to think uh, thoroughly also about what coloniality, decolonization, what does that really entail here in the Nordic uh, region? And especially also in this, uh, in this uh, very trying times where there is something about the the kind of global status, maybe or imaginary, there is of the Nordic uh, region as, as something uh, spectacular, uh, and we're seeing <laughs> quite <laughs> some uh, huge problems. That um, somehow it's important to think also about the Nordic region as being maybe an important. Um, sign or imaginary in terms of white supremacy um, that also um, is, is, is crumbling. And of course, then is also reacting very uh, harshly against, um, against that kind of um, questioning of it. And um, I also wanted to say that that uh, it will be. I've been we Adriano and I have been looking very much forward to engaging in in conversation and 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 hearing the input, the critique, uh, the thoughts that uh, Suruchik, uh, Chris, and Rosalba have. Um, so yes, thank you very much for accepting to 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 be here and to engage. Thank you so much, Julia and Adrian. Uh, Saruji, I think we, do you hear me? We can start with you now. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Fazil, for coordinating and organizing this and uh, all your prompt uh, emails uh, about uh, the organization. And thanks to Julia and uh, Adrian. First of all, congratulations uh, on this uh, important book. And uh, I have actually uh, started using it as a teaching resource. Uh, and the students uh, uh, find it uh, really, really useful. Uh, one of the primary uh, reasons being that it is, while it talks about concepts that are highly debated, it kind of keeps itself confined within the Nordic. So at least by the time, you know, they, are, they have read several chapters of the book, they have a very good idea as to how the debates have shaped in one specific region. So um, thanks again. And now how I, I how I was thinking was because we are a couple of people commenting is that I wanted to uh, bring in questions uh, while while I talk about the book, if that is OK. Um, and I could uh, possibly repeat the questions uh, later on. But these are kind of reflections as one as I read the book. So first of all, um, I would say that the, your book, it's lucid and it offers theoretically rich analytical explanation on the value of coloniality, um, as we all know, a central tenet of decolonial thought in the Nordic region. 
Um, now, through the chapters, uh, I would say that, or, or the chapters explicate very, very clearly uh, the workings of coloniality, uh, which also, as I said, my students found very useful. And I would say in a very refreshing turn, some of the chapters also invoke the idea of resistance to coloniality. Uh, this is important because a lot of the literature that one has come across on coloniality has been useful. It has contributed theoretically. But the aspect of how we cope with it, how we deal with it, and how we move beyond it somehow remains unaddressed. And the chapters in your book, to some extent, have started addressing this. Having said this, I would say I would like to raise the first point that the idea of resistance, which is so central um, and which remains kind of the the underlying, um, you could say the underlying stream in your thought, it remains a little unaddressed in the book. Um, and perhaps I would like to hear a little bit more as to how you envision moving beyond um coloniality, how do you envision taking these debates further um, once we have, once we get a grip on how coloniality works? Um, you have also uh, rightly, uh, your book also and the chapters within it also engage productively with uh, decolonization and decoloniality. <clears throat> um, you have also a very good transition um, where you uh, in the in in the in the book and in some of the chapters where you show how decoloniality cannot possibly be conflated with postcoloniality in fact um, and this is a kind of conflation that we see often nonetheless within within the narrative of the book and in some of the chapters as well my understanding is that decoloniality as scholarship and decolonization as a process, that still needs to be disentangled a little further. So the question here is, is this because the praxis, the applicability, or the material impact of decolonial thought, does it need to be addressed more significantly? Um, have we come to a stationary point here, and we need to go beyond that? <clears throat> what fascinated me uh, also uh, was very much stated clearly in your introduction that you state very clearly that we need to address uh, or we need to have more analysis on racial capitalism and imperialist politics. And I could not agree uh, more with with what with your uh, with your statement here. And and you you explain that you you talk about racial division of labor in the region. And um, and while uh, you say that many scholars have uh, adhered to the critiques of Eurocentrism, some a very few have actually uh, reflected on these Eurocentric paradigms, and they have particularly evaded the question of coloniality of knowledge. I would like to hear a little bit more as to how does racial capitalism and its intersections with coloniality, how do you see them and how are they mapped out, even, even if not so much in the book, but how do you envisage those? Because I think that that would be a very productive way also to take these debates a little bit uh, further. <clears throat> I would now like to sort of an idea that I have been thinking about a lot, um, but it still remains largely unpublished, and that is about the Global South. Um, throughout the book, uh, in your introduction, as well as in most of the chapters, the idea of the Global South has been evoked. Now, um, I would like to actually state here that I find the category um, Global South problematic in the sense that while your book and the chapters 
they they want to capture the experiences of the marginalized communities, experiences of discrimination within a certain geographical region. But do you think that the category Global South captures those multiple experiences of marginalization? Or we need to rethink how we use the Global South. So um, I get the impression that Global South sometimes is evoked as a, as a temporal, spatial, category, whereas perhaps what the chapters and what you're yourself trying to do uh, in weaving these chapters together is that you're using Global South more as a conceptual category, which includes trans hemispheric heterogeneous spaces of marginalization. So as experienced by indigenous, by black people, by racialized minorities, for example. Um, so my my, what I have been thinking about, and I would like to put this now uh, to all of you, is that rather than ring fencing Global South or Global North as different sort of development zones, um, I think it might be more productive, even though more provocative, to locate the Global South in the Global North. I completely agree with your very clear exposition also on uh, your decoloniality, your take on decoloniality, uh, the engagement, the philosophical approach. Um, perhaps what I would like to know a little bit more is what is your critique of decoloniality? Is there something that is amiss in this school of thought, in this perspective or paradigm as has been referred to by various people? Um, and here I would like to uh, suggest that perhaps what you thought was not addressed, which is the politics of racial capitalism, perhaps that could be a way of, of suggesting that decolonial critique also falls short of certain um, ways of thinking. Um, when we are on the issue of race and uh, when, as you also said just now very, very nicely in your introduction about decolonization of knowledge and of forms of decolonization, you also talk about white supremacy, which is also apparent in many, many chapters. It's a very key concept. Um, perhaps that can also be taken a little bit further if one, one is talking about epistemic violence, uh, how it is showed up, to bring in two ideas which, for me, go together. One is the idea of white vulnerability and the other is of white fragility. And perhaps bringing them together could also be a way of moving beyond and and having some points of departure from how coloniality and decoloniality de and decolonization um, have been addressed. So I would stop there um, and I would bring in my other points during the discussion now. Thank you so much, Suruchi. Uh, Chris, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, thank you for asking me. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and it was wonderful to read this book. I think this is such an important contribution. Uh, I am originally from the unceded lands of the Yokuts in central, what, what is now called Central California. Um, but I think what really struck me as coming to, to Finland after a long break um, was the memory work of this book. And I found that extremely important because this this book really gave an important intervention in erased memory. Uh, and it, it, it brought a, a clearer line out of who has worked in these, these kinds of areas. And also, you know, just what the genealogy and is of, of these uh, of people who, who have touched on or tried to work with decolonial or anti-colonial uh, uh, methods in, in Nordic countries. And I think that's super important because uh, so often in, in Nordic countries, people do look to places like the United States or the UK and don't really have an awareness of, of 
the materiality of what has come before here. And I think that's why this is such a valuable contribution because you've you have contributions from many many different communities and and you also have a material contribution in terms of land and extraction and i think that these are just areas that that really need to be deepened and and especially this aspect of memory work uh could be a very fruitful way to to proceed because you know coloniality really is about erasing memory and about you know the kind of uh, whitewashing what has transpired to create uh, the present that that we are living in right now. So that I think is a really important aspect of this book. I think the introduction really places this, you know, in in a you know makes a very important intervention in what's what has been kind of scattered literature. It does bring together. Uh, and and gives a, a way forward for us to to start discussing. But but like the previous discussion, you know, I was kind of curious about how we could have you know a, a deeper and richer discussion about decoloniality, especially between academics and and activists, because at this moment it is so important. I think in Nordic countries where we've had this kind of lurch to the right, and um, you know where. Uh, I, I come from the field is, is of social work like Adrian and, you know, uh, so much of, of the way social work is taught here is, is as a, a depolitical, apolitical type of activity. So I found that, you know, when I'm teaching structural social work students, my Finnish students often say, well, um, you know, the, we can't object to anything because we're employees of the state and we must, you know, follow that that lead. So they don't see social work actually as a fundamentally political activity, which of course it is. And one way to to maybe bridge that gap, I think, could be looking at uh, some of the, the ideas that are coming up with the abolitionist movement um, that, that's in North America, not to transfer on... Uh, a movement, but I think what's interesting about that movement is it's a profoundly anti-carceral approach to social work and more political approach, um, and it 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 centers you know challenging the structures of coloniality and and white supremacy that that are at the core of how you know social work as a as an occupation that manages you know has come from the management of colonized populations. Um, and I, I wonder, like, if a next step could be looking at how to kind of think about abolitionist perspectives in, in Nordic uh, social work, for example. You know, what, what could that give us in terms of, like, moving social work beyond street-level bureaucracy to, to uh, standing with the working class and, and racialized people and others who are subject to these very right-wing uh you know, highly political and and very punitive carceral policies, uh, but but on the whole, I you know I, what I really liked is that this challenges this whole idea of the benevolence of you know Nordic exceptionalism, because that brown branding is very powerful around the world, and I think it's also powerful within you know Nordic Nordic countries here too that that students often don't come equipped with that kind of a critique. Um, because they they it's been instilled in people so strongly. Uh, I I am interested in the futurities. You know what what kind of futurities could could uh, this perspective offer us? Where can we go from here? I think is you know the question, and I think this is a wonderful opening. I I enjoyed all the chapters. I I love this idea of trying to reclaim decolonization because it's becoming a bit of a a buzzword. Uh, now and there's a danger, you know, that this language is appropriated, and and that, you know, we will have to struggle again with how how to to do the memory work yet again uh, to challenge um, uh, coloniality. So, I I think the book shows an act of writing back to to histories that are that are kind of taught um, as settled. I think that this deconstructs these linear narratives that we've had, and it questions, you know, uh, the the this this 
seamless narrative that we have of, uh, it's my dog barking, sorry, the seamless narrative that we have of the benevolence of the welfare state and, and perpetual, you know, progressive uh, uh, moving forward. So I think this is a wonderful memory exercise. And I think the main thing I would like to see, say is I'd love to see more. Uh, so thank you very much. And, and it's, it's an honor to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, Rosalba, you yours. Yes, thank you very much, Fasil, and thank you very much to Julia and to Adrian for inviting me to be here. I am um, also about to use the book, uh, especially the introduction as a teaching resource. And like the previous discussion, I really want to thank uh, both of you, Adrian and Julia, for bringing back Amanda Peralta, who I met so many years ago in Gothenburg to the presence of memory. So it's 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 beautiful that you mentioned her and that you're recovering the way in, she, in the way she hosts many of us when we were um when we were already discussing ideas of decoloniality so many years ago in 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 Gothenburg. But let me start by saying that I I I celebrate uh that this book emerges from a networking experience such as the NOR, because um, that reminds us of the urgency of the uh, generative environments for the colonial scholarship that is so much needed right now, especially in Europe, but in any other in, in any other part of the world. Um, now, I want to share some general ideas that I want to um, emphasize of my reading, and then I will focus on three of the chapters, because these are the chapters that provoke different questions that I would like to put uh, forward for a conversation here. But let me start by saying that I found particularly relevant the um, as a teacher in higher education, the emphasis on uh, learning um, in the chapter by Hannah Helander, Satu, Marjut, and uh, Pieski, and Piga Keskitalo on Sami language educators and distance learning uh, education for Sami children, um, and how they are trying to present um, this process not also of cultural, but also of epistemic resistance. For me, there are traces, very clear traces of resistance in the book. Um, I also found Jelena Vicentic, a chapter on the reproduction of coloniality of knowledge through educational programs as part of international development cooperation, cooperation with the Global South, particularly relevant for the institution in which I'm based and, and is, um, is so, so important that she's bringing this in the context of Nordic exceptionalism. Um, equally, equally relevant, sorry, and exciting is the uh, contribution of Yona Tistea and Gabriela Bancuta on uh, creolizing subjectivities across Roma and non-Roma worlds and hierarchies in which creolizing is actually foregrounded as going beyond coloniality in the Nordic context. So for me, some of the, of the questions that have been addressed for me are present in the book. I think that you are also showing in some of the chapters this, this going beyond. But of course, this is this is my perspective. Um, now, let me focus on three of the chapters, uh, which I, I I found particularly relevant and evocative uh, to have a discussion about the coloniality. One is, of course, your introduction, uh, the chapter that has already been uh, discussed a little bit by Julia Butleja and Madina Sotlanova's contribution. And I want to focus them because, as I'm saying, I think that you are already highlighting important topics that I that I that I want to follow up. So let me start with the introduction. I think that um, your your chapter is very clear. It, it manages to discuss how coloniality as a pattern of power grounded in the idea of race and racism is organized uh, sorry organizes and permeates the Nordics. Um, and something that for me is very important is that um, it introduces the coloniality as one, among many other global Southern perspectives. And this is a position that echoes my own work, the work of many other decolonial scholars in the Netherlands regarding uh, decoloniality interests. That is for many of us is not that of becoming a dominant discourse, but actually enabling conversations, processes of mutual learning that have yet to take place. So this position for me contrasts with understandings of decoloniality as an imperative presented in the introduction, and that might be one of the themes to, uh, that we can discuss today. Another contribution of your introduction, Julia uh, and Adrian, is that it draws on concrete and so necessary connections between the coloniality and racial capitalism, as it has already been mentioned. 
and of course the geopolitics of imperialism in the analysis of the Nordics. Um, as it emerges from an active involvement, uh, as you mentioned, in spaces of decolonial and anti-racist resistance, I think that the book is particularly relevant in the context of current academic censorship and double moral standards on the war on Gaza as an endemic problem of universities in the global north, but in particular in the Nordic countries. The emphasis in the introduction on the quest of decolonization as an ep epistemic stance that counters the ignorance of monocultural approaches such as Eurocentrism, for me is also not only relevant, but it's also so necessary precisely because of the problematic con context of the uh, censorship and double moral standards. Um, for me as well, the introduction is inspiring clear, um, in relation to the coloniality, the, 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 the clear separation, distinction between the coloniality and post-structuralism and post-colonial uh, lens, which is such an urgent contribution to counter what, uh, together with Suleika Sheikh, we are now conceptualizing as a decolonial catfish. And in relation to this, you offer uh, following Lewin Gordon, um, this idea of um, how in addressing the coloniality, many people in, in the Nordics, and I will say in the rest of Europe, is using inconsequential statements following Gordon of positionality. And, and this is extremely, extremely problematic because these statements, as you argue, leave inequality intact and evade any form of responsibility. So let me quote directly from your introduction on this point, a paragraph that I found particularly relevant. And you say the following, it is important here to stress, I open quote, that the problem of taking a post-structuralist approach to understanding coloniality is that it is also a way for Eurocentric critical theory to whitewash the depoliticize, sorry, to whitewash and depoliticize the radical concepts and projects emanating from the colonial subjects in the Nordic region and the, con and the colonized regions of the world. It is critical that we reclaim the political, which includes understandings and political organizing against the materiality of colonial, colonial politics in contemporary Nordic, Nordic societies. And I close the call. Are you unmuted? Oops. Um, Sorry, yeah. shall I continue? Yes, please continue. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so, I found this very relevant that you are uh, repoliticizing a trend uh, of actual depoliticizations of the coloniality. But something that I would like you uh, to to address in the conversation is to what extent you have found that insisting on the specificity of the colonial scholarship, for example, in relation to post-structuralism and post-colonial approaches, reinscribes the logics, the logic of fields and disciplines that reproduces the coloniality of knowledge. This is something that I want, I'm asking myself, and, and I would like to know what you think about it. But also for me, it's important to ask to what extent this precludes coalitions across epistemic differences, which is also, also something that I'm constantly questioned about by students and colleagues. Now, if there is time, because I don't know how is the time, um, I would like to say something about Huria uh, Butlija's contribution that I absolutely celebrate that you bring, bring it in. I, I don't think that every single piece has to speak about the Nordics, but this is precisely the, the work of connecting across our differences. And, and I really love this text as a, as a decolonial feminist. And just for the people that hasn't read the book, this is a, a, a text that analyzes the public unveiling of sociologist Sara Ali, which is a figure of Islamic feminism in Europe. And her public unve unveiling was applauded by Islamophobes, intersectional feminists, anti-racists and progressive, progressives and an, an activists committed to the struggle against Islamophobia. That is the paradox. Um, Sara Lee was identified as a feminist. Uh, and in so doing, uh, Butleja argues that she reinstated the notion of free will and individualism through her action. For her, for Butleja, um, Sara Lee unveiling symbolizes a dazzling achievement of the feminist ideal, the capacity to exercise full sovereignty over one's body and mind. Um, prior to this, that is the paradox that uh, this text analyzes, is that Sara Lee had fought in the public arena uh, by proudly wearing the veil 
and successfully demonstrated that um, she could uh, wear it and follow her faith while being a free woman. So giving countless of women, according to both Lejas, uh, women who wear the veil, the dignity and the respect that public debate had deprived them uh, uh, for, 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 long, for so long. Now, the point of departure of both, uh, both the just analysis is the powerful epigraph that, um, that she writes at the beginning. And it starts by saying, may Allah protect us from the word I, which for me is a really interesting entry point that also is a form of resistance, a concrete, uh, from my point of view, form of resistance because it points into a contribution that unsettles progressive feminist and Islamic feminism as it unearths the entanglements between Islamic feminism and liberal progressivism that is being discussed not only within feminist social movements, but also within the colonial scholarship in the Netherlands. So for me, this is really fascinating and I really celebrate that you decided to keep this piece as, as one of the, as actually the first chapter in the collection. Now, um, just to close, um, because I'm, I'm, I, I think that I'm taking a little bit of more time and I don't want to do that. Let me just close with uh, what I found fascinating and a final question that I want to pose for our conversation in relation to Madina Plostanova's article. I think that this is an excellent contribution that challenges very clearly the, what she calls the post-structurization of the coloniality. And she starts by asserting that the coloniality is not a universalist meta theory. And this is very important from my point of view, because she is reminding us that it, it was shaped as a contextually specific uh, discourse. Now, Madina, in, in her latest work, has also been recognizing, and this is also in relation to one of the previous questions, which are the limits of, of the coloniality. In her chapter, she basically give us some elements of this of this uh, of, a, of a tentative answer of, le, of the limits of the coloniality she is actually uh, madina recognizing that the decolonial refusal to to provide concrete um ideas of a future utopian society makes it vulnerable to critique and she also highlights that certain kinds of academic decolonization have uh you know drifted further and far, further away from the actual ongoing local struggles for land, for languages, autonomy, and the growing gap between thinking and praxis. But she also brings another important element, and is how crucial it is for the colonial scholarship to engage with much more complex understandings and discussions regarding the West, which is demonized as a totality in most of the engagements or superficial engagements with the coloniality. Now, something that I found fascinating from this text is that she's already identifying a serious implication of this totalizing idea of the West. That for her is that the ultra-right rhetoric has hij hijacked the decolonial reading of the past as its core agenda to apply it to ethnic, cultural, religions, Eurocentric, nationalist, and other mythologies that normalizes rootedness while othering uh, not belonging. So it's really important that we look back into this. And I think that um, so, somehow the book brings also this self-criticism of, of some of the gaps of the colonial um, scholarship. Now, to finalize, I would like also to uh, bring a couple of the questions that she formulated when she started to 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 consider that the uh, the um, the trajectory of the coloniality and how it has been copted and depoliticized it starts to be to be somehow closely related to what happened to intersectionality when it was captured by white uh, feminism. She started to think about it in the chapter and she says, well, in order to to be aware of the implications of this cooptation we need to formulate the following questions. And she brings these uh, three amazing questions. First of all, she says, who speaks in and for the coloniality in Europe today? And from what positions is the enunciation made? Then she asks, in what intersections of the coloniality does the enunciation take place? And finally, she ends with another powerful provocative question that is, why is it often 
the case that European discussions of decoloniality stand above the issues they discuss as the observers and remain untouched by the, inter the intersections and power asymmetries in question. I think that this is a fascinating closing chapter um, because it offers at least for people like me within the uh, context of the Netherlands to really start critical conversations with those other uh, colleagues um, and academics that have been literally appropriating this particular uh, uh, problematic standing that uh, Madina rightly uh, uh, you know, uh, presents in her chapter on what is supposed to be decoloniality, something that you can simply uh, you know, put it in your eyes and from that particular vantage point start to analyze everything. And, and, and I think that Madina does a fantastic work in, 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 in warning us about this. But anyway, I will leave it there. I think that I used much more time than I was allocated. I thank you again for this invitation and I look forward for the conversation. Thank you so much. Um, um, Julia and um, Adrian, um, if you could just take um, up to 10 minutes to, to engage uh, the questions or comments raised before we open up to everyone. So to everyone else, please think about questions or if you want to share your thoughts, thoughts, just uh, type it in the chat box or just share it with us yourself, which is the best way. Julia? Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. A lot of questions, a lot of questions. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much, the three of you for, for, uh, uh really really i mean we, we 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 cannot possibly discuss all this and maybe we can arrange a new meeting <laughs> uh but because the, the, the all the comments and the and the and the thoughts um are really inspiring and and, and thought provoking and also very much that's the whole point right to have the spaces to think uh together um yeah, I don't know it's where to start. Maybe, maybe a bit, maybe a bit on 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 the decolonial and decoloniality and where I mean there was something also that so okay. <clears throat> I'm recovering from COVID from COVID, so have uh, mercy <laughs> on me. One thing is that the the that that uh, uh, I think both uh Surupchi and, and Rosalba mentioned is this this to what extent is kind of this reclaiming of decoloniality also a danger in ending up be, uh, defending kind of specific fields that we're ac actually also critical of. That's uh, something that we have uh, also given a lot of thought. And also we we, we have discussed uh, with, when we had a book launch he here in, in Roskilde University in Denmark, um, yeah, to what extent doing that actually somehow um, can also leave us in the in the or inhibit us in working in the decoloniality for <laughs> that we <laughs> yeah um, so that is that is an that is an open question. There was uh, there is also something about who owns decoloniality because. To me, I mean, even though, as you said, um, Rosalba Madinas is right in that the, the decolonial or decoloniality emerges in a specific context and was shaped in a specific context. It's also, it's it also, and back to the memory work that Chris, that you talked about, we're, we're, we're also seeing that or remembering that people like Quijano, like uh, Maria Lugones, they were also engaged in discussions with Cedric Robinson, with, you know. So there's this this whole difficulty in where do we actually, I mean, yeah, where do we, where are we actually uh, forgetting connections that we want to remember because the the South South dialogue, so to speak, has been there all the time. Um, so that is a really, really um, actually important thing that we, we I think it's more a kind of a, um, 
a point that we need to remember to have with us all the time uh, so that we precisely engage in opening conversations and not in 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 closing uh, them off um and maybe um and and i i it's also true that the the ideas that that uh, coloniality or decoloniality has naturalized normalized rootedness um i think that that might be connected with the uh, at least in 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 the Latin American perspective, um, especially the not the, the 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 I mean, because a Latin American perspective is also very difficult to say because there's a lot of discussions mm -hmm. going on in Latin America, but among some scholars and some people, there is this tendency to to uh, not take seriously enough in in the the whole issue of idealizing on the one hand indigenous struggles and forgetting to think about on on the one hand what uh, settler colonialism um and on the other hand anti-blackness as well um so um there is a lot of things that also, I mean, and this, this is not to say that those conversations and those critiques are not happening in Latin America either, but there is there are some some problems there. Um, and I, maybe I should just, I don't know how much I spoke, but I, I'm really also interested in listening and having the open conversation. So I'll, I'll leave it at this and give Adrián a moment also to say something. But thank mm. you, it was really amazing. Suruti, Chris, and uh, Rosalba, uh, I'm very, very thankful for your points, for your uh, critical insights in, uh, of the book. I mean, this is really great. I really appreciate your time and I really appreciate your uh, working with the book uh, in this way. So, so that, that's my, my first thing I wanted to say. Now, regarding <coughs> the question of, I mean, <coughs> This the, the the issue of colo of coloniality. Yes, it is produced as is it it is coined actually within a framework within. I mean, it's the coin of coloniality as a word comes in in uh, from from a group of Latin Americans, but that doesn't mean that it it doesn't have a, a genealogy of that. Before that, you have all the black uh, critical uh, thought uh, from the Caribbean and the, the south of North America. I mean, this is a, this is a, a source of, of uh, extremely uh, complex analysis done during the first half of the 1900s, even in during the 1800s. So, uh, so, so this is a result. I mean, this is evolving. Yeah? This is a result uh, coming to be coined by Aníbal Quijano, which knew very well the work of Robinson, the work of Walter Trotney, the work of Eric Williams, uh, the work of uh, the sociology from Trinidad, uh, Cox, uh, I can't remember his first, his first name, um, all the, the, uh, the black communists uh, in the South, I mean, especially women in the South of, of North America, black women, uh, writing, uh, uh, about the issues of capitalism, racism, s uh, slavery, etc., etc. So, so this is an, an evolution. This is the the concepts. That's why it's in some part of the introduction, well, these are the concepts that are being are trying to be coped by the so-called global north, and it has to do with what Suruchi say about the world, the global south, in in order to once again to you know to whitewash them. And that was our point of departure, I think, with Julia. Well, how can we, in a way, try to point out this 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 issue? Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, you you highlight you point Suruchi uh, the, the question of resistance, central. You know, uh, the, the question of resistance, resistance um, to both uh, uh, to coloniality but how to make resistance out of coloniality and that's something that with julia we came back the whole time 
and I think that you know when I read when I read the published uh, introduction uh, uh, after after it was sorry the the chapter introduction I was published, I realized that we mentioned a couple two three times at, at three times at least I think the question what we need to organize. We need to organize, and we need to organize, and we need to do something with this coloniality question. I mean, what are we going to do? I mean, this is otherwise it will be, I don't know, uh, a very uh, intellectual uh, dialogue that uh, is really nice to have, but then we go back and we go and take a cup of coffee from Malawi, you know, from etc. You know? So, <coughs> um, so, in what way can we organize? And I think that that question has been at the, at the core of many revolutionary uh, um, uh, school of thoughts. Yeah. What to do? I mean, sorry if, if any, nobody likes Lenin, but I think Lenin had a point. What to do? You know? How are we going to, uh, to continue with, with this? Um, so, <clears throat> So it's nothing that we can come and say this is this is the this is the instructions. We cannot say that. I mean, we can just to accompany. We are, we can follow up. We can be with. We can, in a way, try to be part as instruments for also movements uh, or 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 um, um, people's uh, uh, movements in a way uh, to for a change in situation in in the Nordic countries. Uh, that's that's I think that 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 we were discussing with with Julia. I mean, our point of departure in this one. How how can we do? What what can we do? You know. Um, <clears throat> now the questions of uh, just to just to point uh, then once, uh, Chris. I I really like. I mean that that you noticed the question of memory work. For me, as for Argentina, memory work. Madres de Plaza de Mayo, okay? I, I don't know if you, everyone knows Madre de Plaza de Mayo in, in Spanish, in, if I translate it into English, will be the mothers of the Mayo, uh, May Square, yeah? Which is, a, 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 you know, during the 70s in Argentina, you had a mil military dictatorship backed up by the United States and uh, Europe, some uh, France and England and so on. Uh, that disappear at least 30,000 people. Among them, a pregnant woman, you know, they took their children, they killed them, they violated, etc. So, so, I mean, it was a disastrous moment in the, in the time of Argentina uh, in, uh, during the 70s. And the mothers of these disappeared per, uh, people, or these murder persons, started to go around a square called Plaza de Mayo, which is the, the, the May Square. And they go around during the dictatorship. Yeah? So they had really guts. I mean, really, really, they were very brave women. Uh, and not only mothers, but also grandmothers. So, so we have, uh, uh, and, and they have been working with that since then until today. They still go around the square every Thursday. Every Thursday are they at three o'clock in the afternoon, they go around the square that is in front of the uh, Casa Rosada, which is sort of the White House of, of Argentina. Now, they have been working with memory work in a special way. I think it's methods that is, is their methods. I mean, it's uh, very exclusive. But I wanted in a way to try to, you know, to not, I cannot say that I put it here, but it's, it's important to highlight the memory of people that have been doing things also, you know. Otherwise, we just start from zero on, and that means also that we want to highlight ourselves. I think there were a lot of people in the Nordic countries that fight against, the, against racism, as well as, of course, it, much later the, the, the feminist movement started here, as well as, as, well as the uh, patriarchy in the Nordic countries. And, of course, against class oppression, which is central for the, you know, how the, 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 the country works. Mm. So, <coughs> uh, 
uh, and then other kind of operations, of course. Uh, and so, so in a way, in, in a way, in this question of memory work, I think it should be highlighted at something, uh, at, at least um, uh, argued and um, uh, researched also in much more serious and deeper uh, way than just to mention it in a way it, like it did in, in our introduction. Uh, and Rosalba, also, thank you very much for taking up Amanda Peralta, you know, I mean, Amanda, I just been uh, going around, uh, we did a, tra a traduction, we translated the, her thesis from, from Swedish to Spanish in order to come back to Argentina and leave it as part of the memory work of one of the first woman, guerrilla woman, in Argentina. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's something. You know, the first guerrilla woman is the first one. <laughs> and, I mean, and she, she, came, she had to, to leave from Argentina and came here to Sweden as, a, as, as an asylum seeker and she, she, she stayed here until, well, her death uh, in 19, uh, what was it, 2009. Uh, so thank you very much for highlighting uh, on, on uh, remember Amanda Peralta uh, also. Uh, so uh, uh, and I have a couple of questions for you also, Rosalba, because I, I was very um, um, uh, uh, wondering about this decolonial catfish concept that you just say. By the way, and I think that it would be great to to listen a little bit from that because oh, we can connect to. To this, uh, to the questions of uh, of coloniality in this book. Um, <clears throat> so, so just to give some kind of uh, 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 answers of, of um, um, some kind of ideas about what you mentioned, but the the, the issue of how racial capitalism and inter intersection of coloniality goes together, that was the one that Suruchi highlight. I mean, I think that we need, it's not that the, I mean, these are different, how could you say, genealogical, I mean, genealogical processes that, uh, that were coined in different, in different parts of, 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 of the region. It's not to say it are the same, the same concept. They are not. One is pointing, really, really pointing to the question of global capitalism and to understand capitalism as a racial system also. Yeah? That's the racial capitalism. For some will be just capitalism, because capitalism, I mean, the South Africans during, uh, I can remember some of their names, uh, um, uh, during uh, the apartheid system, they wrote uh, a lot about the connection between uh, race and uh, capitalism, yeah? or racism and capitalism, or uh, apartheid system and capitalism. So, fantastic work that uh, that uh, are. I mean, they are not highlighted as much here, I think, in Europe, but they are very well known in the uh, in in the uh, uh, in the Caribbean uh, uh, intellectual uh, world. Yeah. So, do you think we can? Do you think? Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, just you can just wrap up so we can. No, no, no. That I that I think it was a very good question, but I think it's, it, you need. I mean, we need to understand it not that's the same, uh, but connected. Yeah, they are connected. They are. I think that uh, col uh, uh, coloniality, in a way, it is very much. Uh, a, um, a process, a, a derivation, yeah. Uh, how do you call it? De, 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 derivar, como, como se dice? Uh, a derivative or? Derivative, yeah. yeah. Uh, also from racial capitalism, yeah. Uh, that uh, were coined uh, later on as uh, uh, in another way, with other understandings also. Um, as part of uh, of coloniality of power, yeah, because coloniality of power does not uh, exclude the question of capitalism. Put it as a central system, 
in, 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 this, uh, in this framework. So, yeah, sorry, Fazil. It's just when I start, I, and, I, and I thought it was extremely, very, extremely uh, nice and interesting and clever question. So, thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to invite um, all of us to join. So, we are not many people, so please just um, indicate that you want to share your thoughts uh, in form of questions or comments or in any other form. Um, um, so while everyone is um, thinking, you know, um, Adrian, I think you you uh, you mentioned it. You you pointed out at the end. You kind of responded to what you also raised as a question that decoloniality and decolonization is becoming a buzz word. A buzz word. It is interesting that um, whether it is deconstruction, decoloniality, post-colonial critique. Um, um, coloniality, all these become buzzwords, but um, West, white, modernity, developed countries, Christianity never become buzzwords, uh, become like religion that you can never touch them. And, um, and um, you know, of course, we, it, is, um, it is of interest to me, I try to engage it from the, from the South African context, you know, about 1,000 years ago, Abu Rehan al-Biruni, an Iranian historian, a polymath, wrote a book about history of India. This is a, uh, this is a, a time where he is actually an imperial citizen. You know, um, an imperial Iran is taking over the region. He writes this book and he starts with comparing Muslims and Indians and saying that actually in all, all cultures, in a way he's saying all nations are colonizing. So there is no culture that doesn't colonize. You know, in the monolingualism of the other Jacques Derrida says it exactly in the same word, all cultures are colonizing. Edward says, repeats this, you know, Franz Fanon was expelled, his book was banned. The book banning is all over US and universities are completely turned into, um, you know, um, a state um, technology of suppression and control. So, you know, I'm wondering in this context, why would we, why would, you know, just going back to the buzzword, if we're dealing with genealogies and fields of scientific inquiries that are so um, complex uh, with a long history of, you know, epistemological transformation, how can then we speak about a buzzword? I mean, for who? Because we know majority of world population actually have no clue about colonialism or are not interested in decolonization. I mean, in our network of circulating the posters for these events, it is in all continents. We have a network that is across all the continents of this world, both institutions and peoples. And you can see how many people are here today, you know? So, so I'm just raising this as a question and why why do why do these things become word and and not why why isn't decoloniality or decolonization or post-colonial critique addressed as a field of scientific inquiry at universities you know it's open to everyone actually so whoever wants to engage please feel free chris did you raise your hand or did i misread you no but i was thinking about it so you know, I, I think about social work and, and the the how much it is grounded in the idea of uh, settlement houses, which, you know, as, as a historical, this is what social work emerged from settlement houses, which were targeting newcomers to to integrate them. And I think that we're very in, integrated in these kinds of narratives and stories. So I don't I, you know, I think the 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 wanting to to make decolonization a buzzword can also be a way to take away its power you know to to maintain the structure of the field and to make it you know kind of remove the power to appropriate it to make it kind of meaningless just another thing that you might assign to detheorize it um and i think that's that's why it's important to to, to think about this bridge between academia and activism and, and how to repoliticize these words, because 
Uh, otherwise, you know, we just it just becomes this narrative of a uh, this kind of genealogy. I mean, the fact that we don't even question why we still use this term settlement houses and working with working class people and uh, newcomers, you know, it is is you know kind of problematic to me. Uh, but I, I think that the idea is to remove its power, and that is exactly why we need to re repoliticize uh, and look at the carcerality of of what we're doing. Julia? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I thank you, uh, Chris, for, for, for saying that, because I also found that yeah, um, the, the, the points that you made around this and the political and how to, uh, so especially in, in the, in the, in the, in the Nordic countries it is a buzzword in the sense that chris said right it is it has become kind of like <clears throat> okay so when i came here i came I, I came with the decolonial perspective many years ago as uh uh adrian also it was it wasn't taken seriously in academia um and today uh I have colleagues that sometimes ask whether I can come and make a presentation on what decoloniality is, because they, they there is a more and more uh, they they say some of them have said this to me. We what cannot we cannot publish in a journal anymore without engaging in discussions <laughs> with the people one writes about, right? And and a lot of it goes through the the. Um, the language of coloniality or colonization and you know colon colonization of the mind there is many other uh ways of of uh, talking about this so that on the one hand and on the other hand the issue that uh, um the 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 this connects to to chris is that the the as i understand decolonial work or decolonizing work is always already embedded in processes uh, of what we call activism. And maybe that's also the whole heritage that I have from Latin America that that where we, we do have, I mean, of course, there is also the westernized university in Latin America as well, but there's also strong traditions of working across, uh, so of not, um, like for example, participative action research, Orlando Falsborda, that kind of, uh, uh, and also the the, the the feminist tradition in Latin America is also very, very, very strong and always very much connected to, to um, well, not all of it, but to praxis. Um, and the challenge here, as you mentioned, Chris, is here in the Nordic region is that, um, so the, the 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 idea of the perfection of the Nordic countries is so internalized. We can maybe say this is such a colonization of the mind here as well that that um, one of the major challenges um, that I see in my everyday praxis here is uh, with the students who do, they are in a very different place and are actually much more, it's much more giving and engaging to discuss with them than with colleagues because <laughs> they're actually much more um, uh, in tune with what kind of discussions uh, also, the decolonial perspectives brings brings into the 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 the, the game, but then the problem is that they're unable. They they kind of they can kind of freeze, or they're really struggling with what to do with the, you know, uh, they they uh, uh, in in this process of of uh, uh, since. Um, uh, uh, the the renewed attacks uh, Nakba in in Gaza in Palestine, um, something very important happened as well, and this is also apropos resistance, that uh, students who were kind of scattered around, 
took contact with me and then we found out a way to and so they they are now, now connected and they've been they've been in a process of self organizing as well and i think in these trying times it's also apropos the, the remembering is it also also important to remember that that the organization in horrible moments has i mean it has always happened <laughs> it, it is it has always happened and people have organized and struggled and i think it's uh, yeah so to so to remember that as well i think for the students for 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 what i see and and i always say that in in class but this kind of but can can you give us something hopeful i can say yes you're each other right <laughs> back to the the may allah uh, protects us from the word i uh that it's a, about reaching out and actually building communities in the resistance that that i think there is that there is the the great power thank you julia we we have a very um with, um, you can you need to Who's um, um, a colleague here at Jaius, um, and um, after he has shared his thoughts, it's uh, Rosalba. Uh, hi. hi. Is there... oh, okay. Um, uh, good day, colleagues. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, I've had a question that I've asked in passing. Uh, in a work that I wrote about 30 years ago. Just incidentally, I'm a Muslim liberation theologian, dabbling also in decoloniality for the last five or six years. So I asked the question about more than 30 years ago um, about uh, at that time fairly new uh, liberational theology kind of thought. Um, and uh, uh, its emergence in an Islamic form uh, in South Africa. And I raised the question about whether South Africa's uh, industrial status as a quote unquote developed country at that time certainly whether that in any way facilitated the <clears throat> development of Islamic liberation theology. And linked to my question was <clears throat> the ideas of um, <clears throat> the ideas of liberation, whether it was class liberation liberation in our context and racial liberation and uh, gender liberation. In fact, we also dealt with uh, environmental justice uh, at that time, about 30, 35 years ago. And so the question of the location of our thoughts, however progressive or however wedded to decoloniality, to what extent is its bosoms in the academy which is largely an institution that functions within the power dynamics of the, uh, of the empire or of the global north. And when it functions uh, with class and distinction in, uh, ge in the geographical global south, then it does so on the money and the finances of the global north inside the global south. And so, so this is a kind of a very fundamental question for me, and I've never been able to really get a decent answer to it. Our location and our own weddedness inside this academy, um, doing a lot of work to get uh, the marginalized, the uh, heard, and on board, and participating, and all of that not being said. So that's a very, that's a, a quick one. The second one, also relatively quick, is, uh, am I right in thinking that when decoloniality is wedded to another 
liberative uh, endeavor. Say we're talking about um, uh, decoloniality and, um, and sexuality, or we're talking about decoloniality and uh, feminism, feminist decoloniality. When it is wedded, I have less problems with it. When it is unwedded, and we just speak about decolonizing the curriculum, decolonizing society, and then, and, and my concern is often so, so we are the decolonialists, okay? I've already raised the problem of the academy and other things, but we are the decolonialists. And yet, we don't have any, or I, I very rarely see a vision articulated of what is to follow decoloniality. So you work in, say you work in Nepal, where it is very common uh, in many of the tribes of Nepal for women to, when they menstruate, um, they have to go into a little hut about a hundred meters from where the main house is. And that is where they get fed and their food gets, the food and water gets put outside the door and, and, and then after the person had left to drop the food, they open the door, take the food. So the, the decolonizing in the Nepalese context of that community that engages in is in some ways a decoloniality from patterns of cultural norms inside that community itself. But the vision of a life where menstruating women are treated as women and women are treated, that's not part of that community's vision at all. And so when decoloniality doesn't have the language to articulate even as vague uh, an ideal, um, then I mean, sometimes we stuck in a, in a more sensitive version of deconstructionism, a more politically correct version of deconstructionism. So that's one of the things that troubled me, partly because I work inside Muslim society, but not just in Muslim, I mean, I deliberately use a Nepalese Hindu example. Um, so are we, going to, uh, are we going to be critical of slavery in North Nigeria or in Mali, for example? Because we are going to be deeply troubling or, uh, or messing around with their culture, their cultures. And yeah, so uh, these are some of them that are in. I'm, I'm not familiar with any of your work, so my apologies. So I have to ask kind of a question, you know, that um, that belongs to the lower rounds of intellectuals. Okay, thank you, Fred. Um, Rusalba? I, I couldn't hear properly because it was a little bit broken uh, what you were asking, and I don't know how relevant now my comments are because it was actually to connect back to what Chris were, was asking. Um, but if anybody wants to address the question asked ask by Farid, um, I will be very happy to give my, my opportunity to talk to somebody else. Uh, but you can, you can share uh, what you wanted to say and then uh, we can open up to it. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to... Um, to go back to what Chris was saying, because I think, uh, Fasil, your question about for whom the coloniality is a, a boost war, I think that is central. Because for many people, it's not just a war, it has never been a war, uh, it's a praxis. Um, and there is also this, um, this calls for um, understanding that the coloniality is not only a, um, let's say, um, a field of studies within the university. And, um, and when, when, when Adrian was asking me what is the, uh, this notion of the colonial catfish, it actually points out this particular idea, at least in the global north, um, 
on how the decolonial is reduced as a word or conflated as a field of studies or as a theory or actually a critique. Because it's not just a critique, it's a, a beyond the critique. And on this, I'm following people like Sara Mota, who has an splendid uh, practice as a healer, but also as, an, as a decolonial feminist, and who has been questioning the way in which um, in academia we are obsessed with the idea of critique and reproduce this idea of uh, um, an arrogant vanguard that has the way uh, to, to name what is in front of us and what is supposed to be the future of our struggles. And he and she, sorry, uh, puts as an as an alternative the the figure of the storyteller and the healer, who is not through critique, but through a storytelling that is not intelligible to power, doing the decolonial work. So for me, it's not a solution. At, at, on the contrary, it's really problematic to understand decoloniality as a field of studies as well, in order to defend our, our camp and, and, and to defend our right to be recognized and acknowledged by institutions of power. It's actually highly problematic and highly, um, you know, dangerous to be asking for recognition as post-colonial studies or as any other field in, 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 in the disciplines in which we be, uh, might be sitting or constantly fighting for. Um, so for me, that is not a solution. Actually questioning for whom this is a, a boost word uh, is important because then we will recognize our genealogies. The coloniality is, is naming, if may I say this, uh, not something completely innovative. It's, it's like we are coming to, to join a conversation that precedes us uh, with uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, deliberation in in IT, for example, we are naming a moment of um, but but that of of struggles that precede us. And 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 my experience as a teacher in the global north with the students from the global south, because I don't teach the students from the global north. Most of them are students coming from all the continent around in Africa, but also in Latin America, in Asia, etc. Is that they found a grammar in the coloniality that allows them to understand where they are coming from and which are the genealogies they carry with them. This is for me the beauty, the powerful pedagogical possibility of decoloniality. And the second comment that I want to bring into the table is how do we understand resistance? Because I was really very much concerned about this idea that there is no enough of resistance in the book. For me, there is a lot of resistance, especially understanding how Maria Lugones used to understand resistance that can be an active subjectivity, that can actually take the form, as she used to say, of moving your hands because you are a woman of color that is unable to actually enunciate because you are already being strangled by power, no? So when I say there is a lot of instances of clear resistance, for example, the epi epigraphy, let's, let's Allah protect us from the word I, as a feminist, this is a concrete act of resistance, constantly challenge the idea that we are individuals. That is the, the hallmark of humanity and rationality and of course of feminism. This is a conscious act of resistance for a feminist that is, as rightly indicated Adrian, is an activist and she has never, never uh, separated her role as an activist. So I, I think that, um, I think that it's important that we talk about the boost work, but also question where this is coming from. Because then we will be able to um, understand our genealogies, our connections, etc. And And for Farid, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't really understand what you were saying, but I, I, I say yes, when you talk, started to talk about the uh, theology of liberation, that for me is very influential, as well as Zapatismo. Uh, in, in the way I understand the coloniality, I cannot disassociate the proposals from Zapatismo into the coloniality and from and from uh, theology of liberation, but also um, how it has been embedded and grounded in the, in the Netherlands with the anti-racist movement and with the black radical thinking and practice of feminists in the Netherlands. Uh, so the decolonial has its own flavor here as well in the Netherlands, which is not the same flavor back in Mexico where I am originally from. And, the, and it's not only within the university. 
thankfully is not just in the university. It's been spoken by social movements, especially black uh, activists, anti-racist, anti-Islamophobes -Is um, movements here in the Netherlands. It's not only in the university, thankfully. <laughs> Thank you, Rosal. Uh, Saruchi, we will have, uh, just to share that we will have about um, eight minutes. So uh, feel free to, to indicate if you want to say something and please be brief. So. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Rosalba. Uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, Rosalba, what I was trying to, I think you uh, perhaps uh, are misinterpreting what I was saying. I was actually saying slightly opposite i was saying that resistance that often when we are hearing about uh, coloniality when we read about coloniality the resistance to coloniality perhaps gets missed out and i think what is a refreshing turn in the book is the fact that some of the chapters are looking at the workings of colony uh, of resistance what i wanted more was in the introduction and that was more uh, towards um, in the induction introduction for uh, for Adri for Adrian um, uh, and Julia to address was to perhaps bring it up a little bit more because I think that is a very good contribution of the book. So that's why I actually agree with you, Rosalba, that you know there is a lot of resistance, but I think it is such a it's such a refreshing aspect in the book which could have been highlighted and made much more of. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Soruchi. Uh, Yulia? You need to unmute, Yulia. Yes, <laughs> I realized that. Um, I had also a bit of trouble uh, understanding uh, all what you uh, said, uh, Professor Faridisak. I am acquainted with your work and I'm actually very thankful for it. <laughs> um, but, um, and I think, I mean, to me, it, I think Rosalba uh, said a lot of what I would have said also to 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 what you said. Um, and also, um, for me, the, the whole issue of decolonial or decolonizing is um, a question that as Rosalba said is not, is, precedes the ac academia, right? It's way, way uh, much more alive and, and decoloniality, what it does uh, for me as an academic is that it allows me to um, engage in conversations like this that actually open up more than mm -hmm. close down, uh, but also uh, to open up horizons of possibility for students. Um, to again the back to the memory work what is it that they have been structured not to know about like the haitian revolution like the fact that the fact that many of the of of, of the of, i mean the, the the influence also of islam in many of the revolts in brazil for for instance there's a lot of histories there's a lot of connections that 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 it allows us to engage in and explore, uh, which I think are really uh, important. And your remark regarding the, the, the I mean, so, so yes, there can be a tendency that some people then uh, police what kind of research one can do as decolonial research, because then, but that is kind of, that is the, the whole, that is the part that we're critical of, because that is kind of the, the, the making decoloniality something that is not that's not what we mean by it um i when in your example with the community in nepal i also uh was remembered the work of Yeronko uh, yuwumi on on uh, the invention of the african woman right so to me that even uh, uh, Yeronko uh, yuwumi writes that book way before uh, she engages and reads the decolonial perspective, but she's speaking, actually, she's thinking in very similar and kind of to, in terms that then Maria Lugones 
takes up and <laughs> engages in conversation in order to think through, oh, wow, okay, so how, how are the, even the categories of that we believe have always existed might not even, I mean, that is not uh, necessarily so. Um, so uh, yeah, just just uh, just to re react on that, and um, uh, so Lucia, I want also to say something about resistance. But now I'm I'm really tired and my illness, so I'll finish here. Mm. Adrian and Chris, if you have something to share on this before we hit. Chris, do you want to start? Uh... No, I would just say that these are what well, it's great conversation, and I I agree that you know like there is always I think that's what was so interesting to me about this book, is that there are all these unexplored memory areas in Nordic countries as well of resistance and of of praxis, um, and and it's a shame that we as social work educators have a curriculum that doesn't really touch on that at all. Um, and and I think that's the, you know, it it, it feels like a, a smoke and mirrors show sometimes when when you know you have this kind of catfishing of of a a, a concept that that has real power, uh, and and we should work towards contextualizing it and also recovering um, these histories. I was interested to see you know Ula Borla mentioned. I haven't heard her name in years. You know, we need to do this kind of memory work to ex excavate. Um, because it is directly connected with with the folks who are driving also the resistance to, you know, the the, the far right politi political situation that we have right now. So I, I think that all exists here, and and this is just so tantalizing because I want all I want to say is I want more. Um. Uh, no, no. Just, just to f finalize and and uh, and, and say uh, to uh, uh, Professor Farid about that, I agree. Uh, I mean, I didn't hear the second question because it was a little bit disturbing. But the first one about the, you know, the university as part of the Global North powers. I mean, the university has been framed through different uh, process of, uh, I don't know, ed editing books or p publishing papers or whatever. I mean, we are framed within that at the end. I mean, we, we need to go uh, and give lectures and, uh, you know, and uh, fill up the administration papers, etc., etc. And that, <clears throat> but one of the things that I think that, uh, I mean, I try to remember, I, I mean, this is my own suggestion, but I try to remember not to lose the connection with the the, the outside uh, world of the university, uh, to to uh, to connect to arts, to connect to uh, movements, to connect to um, yeah whatever protest or whatever people that that uh, um, wants to I don't know do things because they need to express the uh, uh, their situation yeah. So, so uh, yes, we are framed within the, the Global North Power. The universities are a problem, at least I think what I think it's a problem in the relation to the Nordic countries way of understanding science. Yeah, because understanding science in, in the Nordic, is, is, I mean, you must be pure almost, you know, the, the ideology of pure, uh, the purity. <laughs> You don't say anything political, you just go home, you know, I mean, the, the Minister of Education here came out uh, for 10 days ago, as I say, uh, regarding the question of Palestine, all the protests going on around that a lot of uh, schoolers wanted to sign, you know, letters of protest, etc. That th this minister come out and say that uh, the, the teachers must be at the classroom teaching, not outside doing activism. I mean, well, I think the other way around. I think we should go and be activists in order to understand society in different ways and, and in, 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 the, uh, in different aspects and bring in, not only us, bring the whole mobilization from outside to, <laughs> into, the, into the universities. Otherwise, it's very clean. I, I, and, and this cleanness, I, I, 
I sometimes I, I, I get very uh, very mad. But anyway, so I, I guess I agree with this point. Uh, uh, but I think that we can do it also in another way. The thing is, and I don't see myself as the colonialist. I, I just to wants to mention. I'm not. I'm not seeing myself the one with the word. You know. No, no, no. I try at least uh, to think, and I'm. You know, I'm in a, in this life. I'm processing things that I need to say, and I say, and I say it, and I hope to help people that are uh, oppressed. I hope. I don't know because I am oppressed too, and I need and I need help from others too, and you are helping me here. So thank you very much for to, for today. Thank you so much, Adrian. Um, we are out of time, and just uh, just to share with you um, the second part of the question of Farid was that we need to have decoloniality and decolonization in India and other parts of the world. Yeah. So, you know, India is this example of where the colonized becomes a grade um, colonialist, you know, um, taking over other parts of the world, both internally and externally. Thank you so much for all of you. And um, there are so many other things to share, and I hope that we can continue this conversation this recording will be made available on YouTube and then it will be circulated and uh, no one will be able, none of us will be able to control it. So I hope that is okay with all of you. Um, and I wish you a great time. Uh, so we had friends in Bulawayo, in Zimbabwe, in Nairobi, in Kenya, in Accra, in Ghana, in, in, in Scandinavian region. And um, I wish you all, all the best. And, and before and before before you, you you we leave, I think we you know Fasil arrange all the thing all this uh, uh, webinar, and I think it's a big applause for for yes. Fasil. Thank you very much, really, uh, and and thank you all, Julia, you know, yeah. amiga, thank you all amiga. Very much. <laughs> bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye.